Right, so this is week five. Uh, this week we will be talking about recursion. Uh, this is our roadmap. Um, this week will be the final week for the algorithm design and analysis. Uh, after we finish the topic on recursion, we will be beginning our journey into the introduction of data structure. So uh, what is recursion? Uh, essentially, uh, later you will see a lot of example that is the uh, the art of writing a function that's keep calling the same function but with a smaller uh, set of data right so we will see how this particular idea uh, can be utilized in designing our algorithm we first use some very small scale example in factorial and also Fibonacci numbers uh, which are two very well known uh, series uh, in mathematics and finally, we will apply this design principle to the earlier algorithm that we have introduced, mainly merge sort. And then an optional uh, design uh, presentation is also given on how we can redesign the binary search using the principle of recursion. All right, so as before, uh, we have collected all the code that we used for this week in Colab. So if you want to see how the code work, uh, definitely just click into that. You will see very, uh, very similar uh, division of different sections. And also I think the last part is always about like the performance comparison. And particularly this week, I think the, uh, the use of Python tutor in tracing the program will be very, very important and very, very useful. Particularly if you are confused with like how, really how recursion work, I think the best way is to visualize that using that particular tool. Uh, just try it on your own. Uh, copy the code from the CoLab notebook. And if you, again, get confused, uh, we will try to explain that in class during the interaction uh, interactive session. Right, so now the formal definition. Uh, if you want to detect or try to check whether or not a particular algorithm is designed based on the recursive principle. I think the easiest way is to check whether or not it's calling itself. You see within the function definition, a call to this particular function that you are currently designing, right? So if you look at this way, uh, essentially you are just keep, uh, you, you just keep uh, invoking uh, the same function again and again so and, and your scope uh, is uh, re, uh, reducing so in the way this is also a form of decomposition you start with a large problem but gradually you build uh, just uh, break it into a smaller pieces uh, until you cannot break it anymore so that will be in contrast to the previous week's principle which is the iterative principle uh, iteration, uh, again, is a way for us to do the divide and conquer. So uh, what we introduce over here, again, uh, is a complementary approach to implement a very similar idea of divide and conquer. So if uh, we would like to highlight the benefit, the major benefit of the recursive algorithm is that once you are comfortable with this kind of representation, usually recursion make it easier for you to understand the design of the algorithm. But in terms of the computation, uh, we would like to highlight that if both the iterative algorithm and the recursive algorithm are doing their best to solve the problem, there should be no difference uh, in terms of the computational efficiency. In fact, if you calculate their complexity, they should be exactly the same. But one thing, as we will note it later, is that if you are not careful, it's actually possible to generate a recursive implementation that's much, much, uh, has a much, much worse uh, complexity result, right? So we'll see that shortly. Right, so first example, very simple. Uh, just imagine that we like to calculate the compounding interest. Uh, you have an initial deposit of X, and then you just accumulate in this R percent of interest for Y numbers of years. So over here, you can see that X, R, and Y, they are all uh, parameter to the function. So we use this very simple function to try to iteratively uh, calculate uh, the, the, the final balance that you will enjoy 
after uh, your uh, deposit uh, has uh, matured. So uh, you see that what we do is that we just repeat it for Y times and for each and every year, uh, the current amount, which is X, will be multiplied by one plus R over 100, right? So you repeat R, uh, Y times, that will be the total amount of money you will get at the end of uh, your deposit period. Okay, so we can represent exactly the same computation, but this time using uh, recursion, right? So I think the first note that you will, you will see uh, is uh, uh, this is the first sign, right? So you see that inside the definition of maturity, there's actually a call to exactly the function that we are currently defining, right? This is the part that potentially may be confusing now. Uh, but hopefully as we introduce uh, more and more of this kind of example, uh, you will be comfortable, right? So you see that uh, the call is almost the same, except now instead of uh, using Y uh, during the definition, we reduce the scope. We make the scope slightly smaller by making it one minus one. And eventually you will reach zero and you will terminate, right? So we will talk about like really how do we ensure that this termination will always happen. So the most important, I think, uh, key pieces in the uh, recursion is that we want to make sure that you will always stop. And then every time you call it, uh, you, you want to make sure that the problem is becoming smaller, right? So to ensure that the problem becomes smaller, we have to introduce what we call the uh, reduction step. The code will be exactly the same. That's why you repeatedly just call the same function. But every time you execute the function, you, will, you should observe that the input parameter or some part of the input parameter becomes smaller and smaller. Right? So this is where the decomposition actually happened. And the second part, right? So you, may, you have to ensure that uh, no matter how long you execute this program, eventually there's a definite starting point. We call this the base case of recursion. So now we can go back to the compounding interest example. We try to analyze how do we come up with that kind of a uh, design. Uh, in terms of the base case, uh, the, uh, 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 the, uh, the base case will happen uh, when you have no more year left. Right, so in that case, you simply return the amount of money that's given to you as deposit, you return X. But if uh, you are in the reduction step, it basically means that you take away your Y by one year, means that you have uh, put uh, this amount of money, uh, the, the current balance, which is M, Y minus one, uh, on the account for another one year. So Y is minus by one. Right, and then every year of time you spend in the account, uh, your deposit should occur uh, the, uh, the interest rate of R over 100. Okay, so uh, the time when the base case will happen is when, as indicated over here, when you are at the end of your uh, deposit. So your deposit actually mature, your Y equals zero, right? So this is your uh, best case. Uh, you're going to return x. Otherwise, you're going to make the same function call, but reduce your y by a value of 1. Right? Base, base case, as we see. And then this is the reduction step. All right, so the second recursion example, uh, using the same principle, now we know how we can turn a mathematical formula uh, with a reducing uh, value uh, into a recursion. So now we apply very similar principle, but this time to the factorial function. So factorial function is actually n factorial. Uh, it can be directly computed, right? If you want to use iterative design, then is a n divide uh, n multiplied by n minus one by n minus two all the way until one. And this is one very small example. Uh, four factorial equals four times three times two times one. But you can also try to write the formula of factorial by following the reduction steps, which means that you try to reduce the, the value of n by one every time. So if you do that, then n factorial is simply, you can rewrite it uh, in uh, n minus one factorial, which is the same function, 
but taking in the input value that's one less than the current value. All you need to do is to multiply n to it. Then you will recover the n factorial. So one example is that if you want to uh, calculate the value of 4 factorial, uh, you can derive that from 3 factorial, right? All you need to do is multiply that value by 4. So 3 factorial can be handled, can be calculated by using exactly the same factorial function. All you need to do is that you can reduce 3 factorial to 2 factorial. But this time you multiply that with 3. You continue to do so, right? So over here you can see that you can split a 2 factorial into 2 times 1 factorial. But you cannot uh, farther go, go in uh, farther down the road because 1 factorial cannot be simplified any further. So you have to stop here, right? So this is where the base case will come in. We say that 1 factorial is simply 1. You cannot continue to make it smaller. Right, so you put it together, then you have a very simple code, reduction step, uh, factorial n equals n times factorial n minus 1, exactly the same as the mass equation that we have previously. And then the base case is that when you your n value equals 1, you simply return 1. Right, so inside this recursive function, this is how we achieve it. Uh, we check for n's value if it equals 1 that is our base case return 1 otherwise our return value will be n times factorial n minus 1 right so now uh i mean function is simple but you may get confused about like really how does this particular recursion actually happen uh throughout the uh, function calls uh, this is one way you can visualize it just imagine if you use a python tutor you can type in the, uh, the function definition uh, on the previous page. And then you can enter any n of your choice and you will, you will see this kind of breakdown. As an example, right? So we can maybe just make uh, n equals 5. And if you just uh, keep uh, hitting the next button, you will see that 5 calls 4, 4 calls 3, 3 calls 2, 2 calls 1. Right, so we stop here because this is the base case. Supposedly, we should begin to return since this is the the end of the the recursive call. You see, this is indeed what happened. The value will return back to the case where n equals two, and then multiply with the uh, the value two. It will keep returning back and back until eventually you have reached the uh, the, uh, the end. Right, so that is how. Uh, you can go all the way. This is the divide, right? You just divide the, the case into smaller and smaller instance. And then when you are returning, this is conquer, right? So divide and conquer. It's just that the way we achieve that is different. It's not by the uh, the iteration anymore. Okay, so we put it side by side. Uh, on the left hand side, this is the iterative version. If we analyze that, you start from n, you go all the way until you reach zero. Right, so in total, you will have n iteration. For iterative version, in other words, your complexity is all n. For recursion, uh, complexity is actually very similar because every time you make a function call, recursive function call, n's value is actually reduced by one. So n can sustain, in other words, n different function call, right? Before you n minus one function call before you eventually reach the base case. So if you just calculate the complexity on the right hand side. The recursive version is also O n. So complexity exactly the same. If you look at the outcome, it should be exactly the same as well. This is the example where we do the recursion correctly, right? So you simplify the writing. You basically by defining your function in Python, this kind of a definition actually mimic what the mathematical definition of the, the factorial actually should be. Uh, so now uh, we look at the third example of recursion. This is the case where uh, we potentially can make our recursive design much more inefficient. Let's see how that can happen. So Fibonacci series, again, a very uh, famous series that's from ancient uh, Greece, right? So I think this is a, a series that uh, comes with a very simple rule, but people uh, are fascinated by that, right? For example, the, the famous uh, golden ratio is derived from the, uh, 
the Fibonacci series. So the rule is actually very simple. You actually, this is one of, one of the case where you can have uh, more than one base case uh, for Fibonacci zero, Fibonacci one, you simply return zero and one. But for any value that's greater than that, uh, you see the reduction case down here, uh, your Fibonacci n will be the summation of n minus one and n minus two. Right, so this is where the reason why is reduction is that for both n minus one and n minus two, they can uh, they can be calculated just based on exactly the same rule, but just keep reducing n's value by uh, either one or two, and then when you reach either zero or one, uh, uh, you cannot do anything. So we just uh, return the value of zero and one uh, as the base case. All right, so. Uh, very simple design, right? So we can just follow this mathematical definition uh, of the reduction step and base case, and then we put everything together, right? So this couple lines of code is sufficient to generate the Fibonacci sequence number, right? Two base cases, if n equals zero, return zero. Otherwise, if n equals one, return one. Uh, if uh, it's not zero, not one, we just simply return two recursive, the summation of two recursive calls. All right, so uh, what is the potential issue in this, right? So we can kind of see the issue when we begin to trace the program. Zero and one, of course, uh, there's no recursive call. Uh, we are fine. Uh, and then uh, we can try two and three. Uh, when you uh, try two and three, I mean, here we try to tr uh, just trace the, uh, the numbers of addition. Uh, when you have two, uh, you have one addition. When you have three, on the left hand side, you have one addition, and after you get the Fibonacci 2, it's combined with Fibonacci 1, so two addition. And then if you continue, when you reach 4, uh, you have uh, the Fibonacci 3 on the left hand side and Fibonacci 2 on the right hand side, right? So essentially, it's numbers of uh, Fibonacci 3 plus the numbers of addition in Fibonacci 2, and then you have one more to combine them. So, the numbers of addition, in other words, is uh, the uh, uh, the two smaller cases, uh, addition for n minus one, addition for n minus two, and then plus one. Okay, so if we write everything in a table, uh, you see that as n's value increases, the numbers of addition actually increases surprisingly fast. Uh, you can see that once we reach 100, numbers of addition become 10 to the power of 20 kind of surprising, right? Because uh, this function shouldn't be too complicated, shouldn't, shouldn't be too difficult. Um, in fact, if we implement this by using just iteration, this should be very, very fast, right? Almost a linear time algorithm. But here you can see that the reason why it's growing so fast is that if you just divide these two consecutive numbers of addition operations, they have a ratio. This particular ratio is a uh, uh, converging towards this uh, 1.62. It means that, roughly speaking, uh, if you increase your n value by 1, uh, you almost, like, it's not exactly double, but it's almost, you will have a doubling of the, uh, the addition operation. So that is the issue, right? So you have this, uh, you, have, you, have, you have big O, not quite 2 power of n, but it's uh, close to 1.6 to the power of n. It, it is still exponential, right? So let's see how should we do it correctly, right? So if you have the iterative version, you see that we use X and Y to store the previous two number. We use Z to represent the current number. When we finish, uh, we will like uh, shift Y to X, Z to Y, and then we'll continue until we actually reach N. We return the value of Y that will represent the final number that we should calculate for Fibonacci sequence n, right? So uh, the reason, again, go back to uh, this particular implementation over here. The reason why this particular recursive version is so inefficient is because you see, as you are making calls, n divided by n minus one and minus two, uh, n minus two's value is actually already calculated in n minus one, but you see, I mean, this two is still independent. So although as we are calculating n minus one, we already see n minus two, 
but we make the second call as if nothing happened. And this is the reason why we have uh, almost doubled uh, addition operation whenever we increase ends value by one. All right, so this is uh, what will happen if we do our recursion run. So now again, uh, we use a very simple, uh, another very simple math formula. Think about how you can use this particular recursive relationship to turn this uh, recursive mathematical formula into a recursive function, right? So just call this function power one, and then for this specific case, x equals three and equals 16, quantify the numbers of multiplication, right? And then based on that, try to derive the complexity of power one, right? So this is the, the part one. Part two, we solve the same problem, but we use different uh, reduction formula, right? So which should actually give you different reduction step. So over here, you can imagine that if n is even, uh, you just directly split it, x to the power of n equals x to the power of n over two, all right? And then if uh, n is odd, then uh, it's simply you have uh, one additional x in front of this, right? So relatively simple decomposition, right? So based on this recursive relationship, uh, we can actually write a very simple function over here. So again, use this particularly very simple function to find out the numbers of multiplication of this power two function. And again, try to quantify the complexity of power two. Right, so in another video, we will come back with the solution. So now uh, I think the final part uh, is to apply this very simple principle, but this time to a slightly more complicated algorithm that we have from last time, the merge sort. Uh, the iterated version of the merge sort, uh, we have already traced it in class. Uh, we see that we have level one, level two, level three. Right, so essentially that gives us a button up strategies you start with the group size one and you merge up uh, into pair of uh, two uh, GS equals one uh, subarray. So then you will have GS equals two, you have GS equals four, you have GS equals eight, right? Eventually your group size should be large enough to cover the whole array, which means that the whole array will be sorted, right? So you have, a, you, you're going all the way down from the individual element, and then you merge up, right? So this is the, uh, the bottom-up strategies. So uh, we can do similar design, but this time by using recursion. So if we do recursion, uh, we are uh, adopting a more top-down based strategies. In other words, we start with the full array and we just repeatedly cut the array into smaller pieces until we cannot cut it anymore. And then after that, we will begin to merge back to the, uh, the, the previous level, right? So again, uh, this is the description. I think it's, uh, this method is be best uh, illustrated by the following diagram, right? So over here, you can see that again, a very small one as an example, eight different elements. When we are in the division phase, which is the reduction phase, uh, we divide this whole list into two uh, lists as equal as possible uh, into two parts. We have the left-hand side, right-hand side. They are being treated independently as a smaller list. And then we use the same function to handle these two smaller sublists. So which means that they will be cut into half again independently and then cut into pieces again. Right, so now you see at the lowest level, we cannot cut this uh, single element sublist anymore, right? So by this time, we will begin to uh, do the conquering step, which is to merge up, All right? So 41, I mean, we, I mean, this is one example. We take 41, we take 31, and then we merge up. And this is the same merge operation, the same merge function, actually, later you will see. So we do the first part, and then after we are done, we do the second part, we merge up, right? And on the right hand side here, I mean, we didn't really mention it, but you also merge up, right? Okay, and then we continue to do so until we reach the final step, merge up, and then we finish. Okay, so uh, in terms of the code, uh, very similar, but you see that now we completely adopt this uh, recursive representation, 
Uh, so in terms of the representation, much, much simpler. Uh, we do not have this three tier structure anymore. We simply just call ourselves, call the same function. This R represent recursive, recursive version of the merge sort. Uh, we do have a base case. You see that the first part, uh, we check the size of the list. Uh, if this list A uh, contain only a single element, then we do nothing. We don't do the division, we return. But if uh, this is not the case, uh, what we do is that we are going to find the midpoint. Uh, so the midpoint will give us uh, a rough estimate about the first part from zero to mid, and then the second part from mid to this uh, n minus one to the end of the array. Uh, this is a1, a2, right? So again, uh, this a1, a2, we use the same merge function to merge them and then return, right? So uh, the merge function, uh, this function essentially is the same. Uh, if, uh, again, if this is not clear to you, uh, go back to last week's exponential, right? So our exponential on the merge function apply here as well, right? We use identical a merge function to merge this a1 and a2. So again, if you want to see the sequence, uh, this is how the sequence happened. Uh, if we use the tracing uh, program to trace the execution of the recursive merge sort, this is what we have. Starting from the full uh, list, we go down left hand side, we will finish the, the all the way until the left hand side uh, before we can actually just go up, right? So you see that this is the third, fourth, and then, I mean, we have fifth, sixth, seventh, and then after we, the whole left-hand side is done, we, we move on to the right-hand side. After all the division are done, then we will begin to merge up, right? So you, when you are, you are reaching one and one, you return, then you can actually merge up, right? So again, this is the sequence uh, uh, in terms of how the merge function actually uh, call uh, in, in the order, right? So uh, again, uh, this is a very quick overview about how this algorithm will execute in practice. If you want to experience that in per, uh, just personally, visually, uh, I will recommend that you just copy this uh, very simple couple lines of code, uh, the RM sort and also the merge function to Python tutor. Use this very simple, small eight element array try to experience that. If you feel that eight element is still too much, you can try a four element, right? So just help you get an idea about uh, what what is this recursion all about, right? This divide and conquer all about. Okay, so the final part, again, we mentioned uh, if we do, it, do the recursion right, uh, we should get exactly the same complexity, which means that the way you implement your divide and conquer whether or not is it iterative approach or the recursive approach, uh, the computational benefit should be exactly the same. But what's really making it valuable is that you can see that the representation of the algorithm now become much more intuitive. If you can think in the recursive manner, then it should be more intuitive. And also in the numbers of code, if you go back, you see compared to last week's implementation, I mean, the program seems to be much shorter. Right, at least the, the presentation of the algorithm, right? But how about complexity? We want to make sure that we are not sacrificing the complexity, just like when we implement the Fibonacci sequence. So uh, we do very similar uh, analysis. We want to compare the numbers of comparisons. Uh, so number one step is that we want to find out the numbers of levels that we will keep decreasing the group size all the way until one. So every level, if you look at the previous diagram, we cut the array, cut the list into two halves. So n become n over two, become n over four, all the way until we reach the base case, which is containing only a single element, right? So this log two n represent numbers of times that you actually can do this division until you reach the size one. So at every level, uh, we want to see how many group are there Right, so this size basically represent uh, the size of the merge group, right? So we want to find how many pair, how many merge groups are there. And then for each and every merge group of size, this uh, size over here, 
uh, if you want to look at the numbers of comparison operation that will be experienced by the merge function, uh, in the worst case, it will be size minus one, which means that for each and every element, you will need one comparison to insert that into the return array, right? Except the last one. That's why you have a minus one over here. So which means that n divided by size, this is numbers of merge group. And for every merge group, you have size minus one operation. So if you multiply that, this is very close to n. And then you multiply that by numbers of level. This n divided by size multiplies by size minus one. This is per level, how many operation you will need. So in the end, the complexity will still be n times log n. Doesn't really change, right? So this is good news for us. We have simplified the uh, representation, but uh, we didn't uh, really cause any trouble in terms of the the sacrifice of the uh, uh, the, uh, the the computational efficiency. All right. So here are some uh, exercise for you. Uh, There's two different uh, array of different sizes. Try to do it by using the bottom-up approach, the approach we have introduced from last week, and try to do it by using the recursive approach we have introduced this week. Again, you do not need to I go, although the recommendation is to go through the whole process, but uh, the major thing you need to report is that right before the final merge, uh, what will be the, uh, uh, the state of the array? Okay, but yeah, just do it all. I just trace the program. This particular array is not very large, right? Just do it all. Okay, so uh, if you want more example, we still have binary search, right? So, I mean, we just go through this very quickly, right? So uh, this is the iterative version of the binary search. Uh, you repeatedly just reduce the search valid region from the whole array to uh, like from midpoint to either the lower index or the upper index, right? So this is a perfect case where we can adopt very similar uh, recursive design, right? So over here, you can see that this is the code for the recursive version of the binary search. Uh, we have the lower index, we have the upper index. Uh, over here, you can see that uh, we have used some special technique uh, in Python, we let the lower and upper taking the default value. So when we first call this RB search, we don't specify lower, we don't specify upper, right? Which means that the default value specified in the function definition will be used as the default value, right? So we check if the lowest index value is none, we set the lower to be minus one, and we set the upper to be the length of the array. And the rest are pretty much the same, right? All this uh, if statement, all the different condition are the same. You can view this as the base case. The first base case, uh, if the upper is uh, just one more than the lower, we return minus one. Um, if the uh, the mid equals target, this is another potential base case. Uh, we have identified our element. We also return. Otherwise, we are going to do the uh, the reduction step, the first potential reduction is that uh, if uh, the midpoint is actually less than the target, our key value, right? Which means that our value will be in the second half because the key is actually greater than the midpoint. Otherwise, we will search for this first part, right? You see that although here we write two reduction uh, statement, but uh, only one of them will be executed, right? So this is different from the merge sort. Merge sort, uh, we are going to uh, conduct the, the sorting uh, procedure on both uh, subarray A1 and A2, right? But over here, uh, the searching will only happen in one of the uh, the targeted area. Okay, so again, uh, we have this code. Uh, if you are not sure how this code will run, copy it, uh, just trace it by using Python Tutor. Use a small example. Uh, figure out how this code will work. Finally, as a summary, uh, I think uh, we have illustrated the second kind of divide and conquer design, uh, design approach to allow you to design your algorithm, right? So now we have this comprehensive set of tools. You can do it by using iteration. You can do it by using recursion. And recursion, again, very easy to spot whenever you see 
uh, the name of the function appearing in its own definition, that is the indication that you are applying the, uh, the recursion technique, right? So whenever you are making a call, make sure that there's a reduction in the problem size. And also you have to make sure that the method eventually will stop. And then finally, we have to illustrate how this recursion uh, can be recursive technique can be uh, applied to uh, two, uh, I think, the representative algorithm we have introduced from last time, merge sort and also the binary search. All right, so this is a very quick uh, overview of this very important tool, very important concept. If you want to learn more, I will strongly recommend that you just click on a couple of links provided over here. Uh, you you can also look at this supplementary text that's uh, also it's, it's in Java, but I think this particular part actually talk a lot about how you can better utilize this particular technique. The final note over here, this is optional reading. Right? Whenever we uh, use the recursion as uh, the final statement, uh, there are some like uh, really implication, right? If you are interested in finding out what this particular tail recursion is, uh, you can uh, follow this link, very well written, uh, explained very well. Uh, so I will leave it to you to follow up.